Hello, everybody. Welcome back to this first uh, session afternoon. Uh, uh, this um, afternoon session, uh, we're going to begin with uh, uh, technology and digital material session. And the first speaker is Akkordula Baruga from the University College of London. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Jacob Dugla, and this presentation showcases some of the early findings of my PhD research. Overall, this study focuses, focuses on the pottery and plastic traditions of technologies at the Neolithic site of Magri in northern Greece. And in this presentation, I'm going to talk about the analysis and context of one of these materials, the line plastic flows. Just one moment, it happens sometimes. That's great. Perfect. Yeah, great. Sorry. So we start with a brief introduction to the site. The Neolithic Magri is a tail site located in the coastal area of Thrace in northern Greece. It is the only systematic prehistoric settlement that has been systematically excavated so far in this key contact zone between the Balkans and Sea and the Anatolia. Apart from the important location of Magri, the landscape of the wider area seems to have facilitated the human settling by providing opportunities for cereal cultivation pastoral activities and craft productions. The chronological time frame of Macri has been established based on both absolute and relative dating, giving a chronological time span from 5800 to 5400 BC, revealing one of the earliest sites covered so far in the area. The first occupation in Greek Thrace, although later than other sites in Greece, it is in agreement uh, with the first occupation in Northern Balkans and the Nerbi Marmara region in Western Turkey after 6050 BC. This also places Macri in the wider North Balkan context in Southern Eastern Europe, characterized by similar stylistic attributes and practices as reflected in their material culture. The excavation of the site revealed the presence of prehistoric Neolithic remains in the eastern part of the Low Mount. Three main sectors were identified in the site, the open area, the so-called complex storage area, and the residential space in Trench Verta uh, 8, in which these studies focused on. The decision to focus on this trench was because it has been uh, well documented and fully excavated, providing a full record of the successive Neolithic layers. Also, it presents rich and well-preserved architectural and material remains, including lime plastic floors, post-frame houses, clay structures, stone and bone tools, and the large pottery assemblies. This research concerns the study of the two of these materials, the pottery and plasters. The integration of these materials gives us the opportunity to examine the wider uses and technologies of ceramics at the site. Both pottery and plasters are classified as ceramics and considered craft technologies following similar and different steps in production. Although the purpose and probably the scale of this production are different in the particular case, their analytical and systematic study allows us to obtain more information on specific aspects of the prehistoric crafts, including the use and processing of raw materials, pirate technology, and the organization of production as reflected in the management of resources and the set of skills needed for the manufacturing of these materials. As said in the beginning, I will only refer to the line plastic floors. So the main core questions for the study of this type of material are first to identify the specific recipes in floor plastic production, such as the use of selected timbers to obtain diverse floors and the repeated occurrence of uh, specific floor types in particular areas or units. Second, to identify source materials and production choices by examining the composition of floor materials and the local sediments collected from the vicinity of the site. And third, to compare the characteristics of the lime plaster production in Macri to the available data on Neolithic lime blasters from contemporaneous sites in Greece and Anatolia. In general, the study follows an integrated research approach 
combining both qualitative and quantitative techniques and considering all the stages of analysis by implementing the relevant analytical techniques of each ecological question. Specifically uh, for the line clusters, this study makes use of the following methods. Macroscopic observations, petrography for the characterization of the line and other aggregates present in the floors, and micro XRF, a semi quantitative approach for, for the generation of compositional maps and the illustration of compositional uh, changes within or between the floors and features. Supplementary to these methods, FTIR and SEMETS will be used on select samples of interest for specific point observations or to evaluate the results of the previous techniques. So one of the exceptional features of the site is the good preservation of successive lime plastic habitation floors. Nine well prepared, the so-called formal floors, have been identified in total from map to face, succeeding by a series of roughly made floors characterized by loose materials and domestic fuse. It is worth noting that MACRI 1 phase A has no evidence of lime plastic floors, but only for floors consisting of clays, earth, silty clay, and carbon. Interesting outcomes from the previous analytical studies on some of these materials uh, were the persistent and repeated reconstruction of lime plastic floors during the entire last month of the settlement, suggesting cycles of renovation under communal decisions. It has been also suggested that uh, the construction of formal floors may reflect a beginning in the life of each building and major changes in the household, while the informal floors may represent out of ceramic repairs and local events. So if we place the plasters within the context, plasters and mortars are semi-vicious materials that often described as artificial man-made rocks composed of the binder, water, aggregate, and other additives. The three main binders used during the history are the clay rich mud, gypsum, and lime, characterized by different properties. Focusing on the lime plasters, the process to produce them is called lime cycle and involves three main stages: the calcination or burning the hydration and carbonation. The raw material that is used can be either limestone or other carbonate materials like serge or marble, heated at temperature between 600 to 900 uh, yes, degrees or above. Compared to other binders, the lime-based products have improved to have many benefits, including greater durability and strength, a major improvement in binding raw materials technology <laughs> that could potentially explain the widespread use of the lime in the archaeological record, of course, considering other aspects of accessibility and availability of this material. Although the use of lime plaster in architecture is widespread in areas already from the 9th millennium BC, its use is still very limited. Uh, Neolithic Greece found only in four sites so far, indicating either their occurrence or their, or their limited or no attention in the theological records. The rare occurrence led, of course, to the limited analytical study. Uh, most of the archaeometric studies on lime plasters from the historic Greek sites have been conducted after 2005, focusing on Neolithic plaster floors with emphasis on the development of methodology for the analytical study and the characterization of the production. However, the main problem with the study of the archaeological lime plasters is that the identification of the lime is not as straightforward since the natural precarious materials can be very similar to the carbonated pipe. The identification is even more challenging in the prehistoric clusters, which contain very small proportion of lime, and some of these were produced with burnt calcareous material rather than through lime. Um, although the analysis of the available samples has just started, I will share with you some of the preliminary results. As said earlier, the well prepared floors consist of a series of overlapping thinner line plastic floors with occasional in between moderate prepared floors. Six of them belong to the phase C and three of them phase B of MACRI 2, separated from each other by approximately 30 centimeter distance, apart from uh, floor 7, which is separated from floor 6 by uh, one meter. Um, the good quality. Yes. The good quality floors uh, have a crazed white color and compact texture. Their hardness depends on the amount of lime and other plastic aggregates used for production. Most of them preserve a finishing coat of red clay or laminated debris of organic rich material 
indicating a frequent cleaning or maintenance of these floors, as confirmed by the very thin replastering of some of them. The composition is mainly quick line fragments of burned and unburned soft porous um, terrestrial uh, limestone covered in of tufa, available in the vicinity of the site, mixed with few aggregates, mostly plastic sediments. The occurrence of abundant lumps of lime probably indicate dry slacking, a uh, hot mixing technique, with the use of low amount of water and crude mixing with the aggregate directly applied to the floors. The carbonation process can be characterized by the following features. First, the presence of the so-called lime lamps that uh, may represent unreactive, half-reactive or fully reactive quick lime, therefore incomplete or complete carbonation. Second, the crystallized lime uh, matrix with incorporated carbonized lime lamps. And third, the presence of original sedimentary features such as fossils, indicative of the use of raw limestone or insufficient burning in most cases. Uh, the poorly preserved floors, as the layers found between the good quality floors, are characterized by a mixture of loose material, mostly unburned travertine, as hydrated lime lamps, together with other mineral and organic components within a clay and lime with its binder. These layers are thicker than the good quality floors, ranging from uh, 20 centimeters to 40 centimeters thickness. The criteria. <laughs> The criteria that define these layers as floors and not accumulating occupational deposits are the preservation of smooth surfaces due to the final finishing and the parallel planar bedding. The homogenization of the materials found in the poorly made floors indicate intentional incorporation of occupational debris derived from indoor and outdoor areas when these floors were constructed. This comes uh, in, contrast, in contrast with other compacted layers that seem to have been used as foundation fields. The latter have, uh, has a homogeneous deposit uh, with no layered appearance. A foundation field has been identified between floor 7 and 6, so between a phase uh, B and C of MACRI 2 in all sectors, which possibly indicates a renovation phase of the settlement. Sediment analysis and changes on paste recipes and decorations of pottery has also confirmed this habitation gap between the phase B and C. It will, it will be also interesting to see whether there are any changes on the manufacture of monolithic floors between these two phases. micro XRF elemental mapping applied in one of the samples so far gave us a general pattern of the major and trace elements abundances in the different types of floors and allow us to make further inferences in the composition. We can clearly see the very fine formal lime floor composed almost exclusively of calcium with a silica rich finishing layer. A thinner potential lime replacing on the top with more than one mixture can be also noticed. Interesting enough is the smooth finishing layer of the informal floor with a finer grain aggregate, as well as the different types of components in the roughly made floor compared to the almost impure and fine lime plastic floors above. The integrated analysis of other samples will eventually yield more information on the technological patterns characterizing the construction of the different successive prehistoric flows in the settlement, sending light on the context at scale of reproduction in terms of the selection and processing of raw materials, use of firing, and potential changes on the production choices during the settlement's lifespan. And thank you very much.
Hello, everybody. I'm Katerina Zaja, PhD candidate from the University of Cambridge, and today I'm going to tell you about Egyptian clusters, specifically focusing on the case of study of Makebu. So firstly, we need to define the word paste. We need to understand that in Egyptology, the term cluster has been used rather loosely, without a specific chemical definition, and it was including different kinds of materials and preparations. Throughout all the talk, we are going to use the generic definition of paste, which doesn't imply any particular chemistry or technology, and includes all the kind of real plasters, so treated with heat, and plaster-like materials, obtained by granted stone mixed with some kind of binder found on these artifacts. The, mo the most common kind of paste in the period that you are analyzing are mud, gypsum, and lime paste. These pastes were not just used as preparatory layers, but we were found in the constitutive layers of other structures as cartonage. Mummy masks made complete in cartonage started to appear in the Old Kingdom, and in the 22nd dynasty, the whole mummy case was created using this technique. Cartonage was characterized by layers of linen, soft in glue or gum, interdispersed with paste. These strata were applied over a mold that was removed while the cartonage structure had dried but was still pliable. A layer of white paste was then applied on the, on the side to provide a smooth surface for the bigger application. The study of this space is the main topic of my PhD project in which we hope to answer several questions related to their nature and their use. So can we differentiate this space from a chemical, elemental, microstructural and mineralogic, mineralogical point of view? What can similarity or differences in the making of these materials tell us about broader aspects of the funerary craft, technology and social conditions? And also, is it ambitious to aim to create a new technological and analytical protocol, mostly based on non-destructive technique? In this context, up to date, we were able to apply all this idea to a specific office set, the one of Pakepu, based at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. So, who's Pakepu? Pakepu was a middle-ranking official who lived in Thebes during the 25th dynasty, around 500 BC. His coffin was found in the West Bank of Thebes in 1896, and he reached Cambridge later on. The coffin set of Pakepu represents a perfect example of a nested funerary structure present in Thebes during the 25th and 26th dynasties. So between the end of the 13th intermediate period and the beginning of the late period, it comprises an urne and an intermediate coffin made of wood, mostly sycamore fig. It had also probably a larger outer Kersu coffin, which uh, was never recovered. The anthropoid intermediate coffin has a thin decorative surface of ground layer and painted layer on the inner and outer surface, while the inner coffin has a structure defined by the team of the Fitzwilliam Museum at pseudo cartonage due to the presence of a wooden support. So it's different from the previous one because it's not a freestanding a freestanding material. Okay. On the table, we can see the reconstruction of the internal stratigraphy of pseudo cartonage after the first preliminary analysis made by the team of the Fitzwilliam Museum. Very interesting is the presence of a white paste and moreover of a pink filler. So the question is, are they similar from a morphological and chemical point of view? Moreover, they encounter the presence of a fibrous glue between the layers, which serve a better understanding because it was never registered outside tips and prior to the 25th dynasty. We had the different questions about the paste of the pseudo cartonage, with a particular attention to the difference between pink paste and white paste. We also were very interested in the characterization of the fibrous glue. To do so, we employed several analytical techniques, mostly non destructive and possible, as optical microscopes, MDS, FTIR, polyglutamic techniques for the organic components. XRF was applied, but the results are still pending. Uh, the coffin set was then compared to the result obtained from the analysis of fragments, called comparison fragments, coming from the same area and the same period. In this way, we were able to see analogies or differences in the construction of paste. Uh, in these images, we can see in green the area in which we acquired cross sections, in blue the areas in which we sample the paste, and in red the areas in which we sample the fibrous glue. First of all, we use the optical microscope. So before sampling, we were able to reconstruct the layer of pseudocartonage and to identify the areas of interest. After sampling, it was useful to observe the microstructure and the appearance of a different paste. The images obtained were used mostly as reference for the following analysis. And also here, where is the mouse? Okay, here you can see the wooden support that I was talking about. So the SEM has been used for three different reasons. 
First of all, to have an idea of the microscopic morphological features of the grains of a different paste. White paste uh, appeared more homogeneous and regular, that is here, while uh, the pink paste uh, here was characterized by big grains and clusters. In this specific case, for both white and pink paste, calcite was recognized due to a particular cubic shape, and also for the chemical composition, as we will see later. Afterwards, we measure the size of the grain to define if it had been treated with heat or not, so if it were real clusters or not. We did this employing ImageJ software. To be considered real clusters, the grains of calcite should have a size that is smaller than one micrometer, because in the two cluster, calcite grains are recrystallized to the, to the high temperature, hence they appear smaller and more regular in shape and size. However, this was not the case of a Kaku coffee set, not for the inner coffee or for the intermediate coffee, and neither for the comparison fragments. As we can see from the graph of the grain size distribution, the average value was always above one micrometer. So we can theorize that all this space had been uh, obtained just by crushing limestone and mixing it with some kind of binder. We can see this for the inner coffin, for the intermediate coffin, and also for the comparison fragments. Uh, the presence of microfossils in the paste, as for this sample coming from the inner coffin, supports also the previous hypothesis that were not being treated with heat. SEM was also used coupled with an ADS detector to determine the elemental composition and assess the distribution of the elements. As we can notice, calcium and silicon are the main elements for both space. So the hypothesis of calcite is supported. However, we can see some differences in the minor elements and in their distribution. The composition of a white base looks more homogeneous, while the one of a pink base is characterized by a bigger variability. Moreover, important is the presence of iron in the pink base. Our hypothesis is that iron oxides are the components which give a characteristic pinky shade to the paste. It was first theorized by the Fitzwilliam Museum's team that these components have been added during the production steps. But I think actually that iron oxide was actually present in the original geological material as an uh -huh. impurity. Okay. As an impurity, because it looks homogeneously distributed throughout the surface. More analysis, uh, however, are required. Uh, further on, FTRR has been employed to identify the chemical compounds present in the paste, and so to confirm the results obtained with SEM. In yellow, the peaks characteristic of a white paste are highlighted, which are basically the ones of calcite. While in green, we can see the peaks present in the pink paste, probably related to the presence of iron oxides. Uh, the characteristic peaks of calcite so here, uh, are around 1420, 874, and 712 are recognizable in all pastes of a sample. While an interesting interpretation of two reasons, around 1084 and 779, have been suggested with the overlapping of a slate red spectrum, a material rich of iron oxide, and this is what is present in all the pink pastes. FTIR was also employed to reconstruct the pyro technology of this paste by means of the 2 over V4 ratio. The ratio is obtained dividing the 8 of V2 peak by the 8 of a V4 peak, and this represents the extent of the atomic disorder in the calcite structure. If the result is lower than 3.3, this means that we are in front of geologic material not treated with heat, and this was the case of Pakepu and all the comparative samples. Few samples have a value higher than 3.3, but in that case, even if treated with heat, the temperature should have been so low, but it didn't allow any kind of calcination. So in the graph, you can see in black, the comparison sample, in red, the outer coffin, and in orange, the inner coffin. Finally, I would like to say a few things about the analysis of the fibrous glue found between the layers. The fibers were observed under the, under the optical microscope and the SEM. With the latter, we were able to notice the characteristic wave pattern of collagen. However, more analysis were needed to support the hypothesis that this was not from uh, uh, a plant fiber. The FTR was employed for preliminary analysis to evaluate if collagen was really present and so if paleoproteomic techniques would then be uh, reasonable. In the spectra, we can observe the characteristic peaks of collagen around 1651, 1548, and in the region between 1454 and 1403. We also see a great similarity with the characteristic spectra of wool. This supported the idea that more analysis, especially with phalloproteomic techniques, were needed. Up to date, 
Those few samples from the comparison fragment have been processed to be analyzed with Maldi. After this first analysis, we can say for sure that collagen is present in the, fiber, in the fibers. However, more analysis are needed to identify the animal species. So, the conclusions. <laughs> We see similarities between Pakepu and the comparison samples, so we can suppose that there are some kind of common practices in tips in the specific period. The paste have not been treated with heat, so they are not the two clusters, as visible with SEM and FKIR. And the main components of the white and pink paste was calcite, followed by silicon in terms of relative abundance. We suggest the idea that calcite is present and geologic limestone from a nearby area had been used for vacation of this paste. Also, the white paste appears very pure, while the pink filler paste uh, looks like it was mixed with some kind of clay. Differences in the morphological appearance and distribution of minor elements between the two pastes are visible, which suggests the hypothesis that the same processes have been followed for the creation of the pastes, but uh, that the same mixtures have not been used for the two different pastes. Finally, the fibrous glue is mainly composed by collagen, and other analyses are needed to define the animal species. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to the organizing committee for giving us this opportunity to present our works. So I'm here today to present to you uh, the works in the framework of my PhD project, uh, which focuses on clusters and mortars. Today I'm here to present part of my samples, and especially the ones from the Hellenistic Theater in Epaphos. And I'm here to present to you the very first preliminary results that we obtained over the course of the past year. Uh, the aim of the entire project is to try and characterize these clusters and mortars and to uh, connect uh, in, uh, in the area, in the broader area of the Neapathos quality region and see if there were similarities or differences in the production of this uh, particular building material. As I was saying before, today I'm only focusing on the Hellenistic theater, um, which is located in the northeastern part of uh, the city of Neapathos, close to where uh, the northeastern entrance gate to the city was located. It is one of the first um, buildings that was ever built in the new town of Neapathos. And we know these. Uh, <laughs> also because it has a different orientation compared to then the latter uh, grid of the city. I don't know if you can see the cursor, yes. Um, so this is the plan of the theater. Uh, and as you can see, it follows this orientation while the later structures like this one, which is the new film and the uh, road follow a different orientation. This can be due to different factors. First of all, of course, while building the theater, they were trying to follow the orientation of the hill, uh, but also it can be due to the fact that there wasn't like uh, the, um, laid over plan that we can see now. The theater has been excavated since 1995 by um, a mission led by the University of Sydney. Uh, the theater has all the uh, typical elements, so we can see a cavea, uh, the orchestra, the stage, the paradoi, and uh, here on top uh, you can see the uh, vomitoria, the exit from the cavea. Um, my samples, um, before talking about the samples, a bit of context more. Uh, since it was one of the ancient, most ancient uh, building in the city, it of course underwent uh, a series of different phases, reconstruction and uh, 
changes. Of course, there's no time today to go through all of them. So I would just like to point out that foundation horizon is around 300 before the current era. And the last uh, refurbishment is dated to the third century current era. Uh, the abandonment was around the fourth century with the affirmation of the Christian religion and the complicated relationship the theater institution and early Christian uh, had. So it went through a decline phase and it was definitely abandoned. Uh, our sample belong only to the last two phases, namely after the earthquake of 126 uh, current era. Uh, there aren't many samples of the periods before. The earthquake was quite devastating, so the theater underwent almost complete uh, refurbishment. Uh, we have the idea that some of our masonry mortars could be possibly of earlier period, but it's still an hypothesis that I cannot still confirm. As I was saying, uh, our samples were taken in order to cover all the main areas of the site. Uh, and so to have a representative uh, pool of samples for every uh, single uh, structure. Um, also, uh, we try to sample uh, at least two different samples for each uh, typological clusters. There are um, several categories of plaster. We do have wall plasters, which we sampled, uh, floor plasters, we also sampled, waterproof, uh, waterproofing plasters, which we also managed to sample, and masonry mortar. For the theater, we also have a very specific feature, which is the seat ceiling. It's basically layers of plaster that were applied over the seating in the cavea. And these samples were very uh, refined and well polished. So the quality is very impressive, even with this much time passed. Um, here, I would like to just show you briefly some pictures. You can see on the top where the cursor is. This is some samples of seat ceilings, as it's possibly already visible in the micrograph. Uh, there are several layers. Most of the times we have two. In several samples, we even have three layers. And in between the layers, we can distinguish dirt, which means that these layers are probably refurbishments. So there are used layers and not structural layers. Then we do have this other very peculiar sample, which at the first macroscopic look looked uh, quite easy to understand. We could see immediately three layers. Then we cut it and we saw six, <laughs> more or less. So this is uh, a very complicated uh, um, part of our analysis because we do have many layers and it's not easy to understand fully uh, and clearly <laughs> these samples. The methodology we followed combined a different set of techniques which gave us information on different level. We first of all applied portable uh, X-ray fluorescence here and after portable XRF, which is a technique, it's non-destructive and semi-quantitative, and it gives information about the elemental composition. We applied this te technique on the entirety of the samples. I must say that although it is a completely non-destructive technique because it's a surface technique, we decided to apply it, it, apply it in a destructive way. Uh, so we decided to crush the samples in order to avoid the mistakes due to like a surface decay or weathering. And so in this way, it actually turned out to be a destructive technique. Um, and we included the binder and the aggregate function in this analysis. So it's the whole sample. Then we applied X-ray diffraction, which is a micro-destructive technique, and it's fully quantitative and also qualitative. The information type uh, is mineral composition, and we applied this analysis and the following one, thermoperimetry, only on the binder fraction. We separated binder and aggregate, and our uh, crit criteria to uh, separate these two layer was to gently crush the mortar and sieving it. And whatever was below 0.63 millimeter was considered binder, whatever was above was considered aggregate. Of course, it can be discussed later how efficiently uh, we can see of course. Then we use the thermogravimetric analysis, which again are micro destructive and quantitative, but they give information on material composition in general. And finally, to gather more information about physical properties,
properties, we applied porosity and water absorption tests, which are semi-destructive. What are our results? The portable XRF results were the first and easiest to obtain. Um, they were, um, this technique proved to be very efficient to give us a pre-screening uh, idea and some pre-screening results. It was very uh, visible, even from the semi-quantitative uh, results, uh, which was the main binder. Uh, and this proved very also helpful in the moment of the qualitative analysis of X-ray diffraction. The X-ray diffraction was our main tool. Um, again, I would like to stress that we did it only on the binder fraction. So this is also why the semi-quantitative PXRF and the XRD results differ. Uh, moreover, this is mineralogical, the other one is elemental. Our key result was that we analyzed that in our pool of samples, uh, the calcite is the most predominant binder. As you can see, it's the blue. Um, I can see the cursor, I hope you can. Um, it's the blue um, columns. Uh, it's the most predominant binder. We only have two gypsum samples. Gypsum is the orange one. These are almost pure gypsum. The percentage is over 90%. We analyzed also the aggregates in this case, and it's also gypsum and other things. But um, we also identified the similar behavior in these two samples, which was very interesting because macroscopically, chemically, and microscopically, they do have the same characteristics. They, pr they um, were taken from two different areas. So this can give us an information that they were either using the same exact receipt or maybe even were done in the same period. Of course, it's still too early to give you a final result on this. And finally, we identified a very interesting sample, our sample MPT12, which will come back in the next slides also. This was a waterproof mortar. Um, and analyzing the binder, we found almost pure calcite, which was a bit surprising for us, but I will come to it later. The thermogrammetric analysis proved to be very effective also because they confirmed the quantitative result of the X or D, as you can see from the table. There are only slight variation in the percentage of calcite, which are to be expected. We already knew from previous analytical work and from other literature that it can happen during the X or D results that part of the calcite component is read as amorphous phase. So the percentage with thermogrammetric analysis can be slightly higher, uh, but it's not a concerning point. What was concerning is our sample MPT-12, which presented a completely different result. This can be due to two different factors. One is, of course, human mistake, uh, meaning mine, uh, and the other one is that it can happen that since these materials are very heterogeneous, we could have hit some more pure particles with the X or D that we did not find in the thermogrammetry. We tried to uh, analyze the same exact sample, but of course the samples are very heterogeneous, so it, this can happen. We will repeat the analysis, however, and I will be able to tell you more. With thermogrammetric analysis, we were also able to uh, identify two different behavioral patterns in the uh, calcite-based samples. As you can see from the two um, spectra on the side, the one on top uh, has the um, carbonation process starting uh, earlier than expected, and it presents two different processes merging in the area circled. Uh, we are still investigating this. It can be a result of presence of two different calcite type, uh, but it can also be a result of different things. We will know more when we will be able to analyze the raw materials, which we have sampled. The second group is the more standard one, where the um, complete uh, carbonation of the uh, calcite starts at 600, which is the standard uh, number. Finally, we had uh, porosity and water absorption tests. Here, before I dig into the result, it is important to stress out that we actually um, did this examination in parallel with the rest of the analysis. So we had a hunch that NPT2 and NPT2 eight were the samples made of gypsum, but we did not have any confirmation. So we still tested them 
And of course, since there is the gypsum, we lost about five to eight percent of the sample during the water absorption and porosity, which is not acceptable for having uh, good results. So we will test them again with uh, helium uh, pycnometry or uh, mercury immersion porosity. Uh, two interesting samples are again MPT12, unsurprisingly. This, as I was saying, was a waterproof mortar, but it had a porosity of over 43%, which is not very waterproof. So our uh, two main hypotheses are that either this material is severely weathered near the composed, or the waterproofing was actually enhanced using waxes, oil, or something similar. We are in for more tests for this sample. And also a nice surprise was from NPT-10, uh, which was actually very waterproof, <laughs> although we did not expect it to be. It showed a very low porosity, very low water reaction in general. So it was a nice, uh, interesting uh, information. To conclude, uh, this was a first very successful trial for our samples. We were able to identify the main components. We were able to recognize a similar behavior, both in the gypsum sample and also in the calcite samples. We also managed to recognize two subclasses inside the calcite samples, and we individuated some uh, samples which are interesting to go for further analysis, especially MPT-12, uh, and we would like to apply both uh, optical microscopy and dissection, SAM, and possibly some mechanical tests to have some information like strength uh, and similar information. Uh, we also managed to establish a clear analytical procedure, which was a key factor for this research in general, uh, because the total amount of sample is about 100, and we plan to almost all of them. Lastly, I would like to acknowledge, first of all, the PLACE project uh, and then the Paphos Theatre Archaeological Project, in particular Dr. Craig Barker, which helped me with the uh, acquisition of the sample, the Department of Antiquities all for granting permission for this study, and the Centrum Telch in the Czech Republic, and especially Dr. Irena Adamkova and the Dr. Petra Matsova for their help with the XRD analysis. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, this presentation is uh, based on my PhD research with the topic uh, sampling characterization and reproduction of historic materials from uh, historic plasters from Cyprus with a special emphasis on hydraulic line plasters. Uh, on this map, you can see the different excavation sites that I will study during my PhD. And today I will talk to you about the Akaki and Kitium Pagula excavation sites. So during my PhD, I will use a set of archaeometric techniques to identify several physiochemical and mechanical characteristics of the historic material. And with this data, I will fabricate uh, several different recipes for the reproduction of the historic material so that we can better understand the evolution of plaster technology in Cyprus and investigate their application for the restoration of similar structures. Today, I will present to you the results of uh, microscopic observations, portable XRF uh, analysis, and X-ray diffraction analysis. A few words about how pozzolanic, uh, excuse me, how hydraulic plasters are made. Uh, so we can add a pozzolanic material to the produced uh, slack line uh, that, so that the pozzolanic reaction can occur. This reaction can happen underwater and it produces the CS8 and CA8 amorphous phases which give to the material its hydraulic properties. 
Uh, the pozzolans that were used during antiquity are tufts, pumices, and other volcanic rocks, and ceramic fragments and powder. Uh, during the Roman period, this last material was uh, called opus simium or cocciopesto uh, in modern Italian. The Kitian Pambula is a late um, classic to early Hellenistic excavation site located in Larnaca that consists of a military port with its neosiki, uh, the port basin, a sanctuary, an industrial area which was probably a fullery for uh, much manufacturing clothes, and a south building. The material that was uh, sampled were the first and second layer of uh, plasters from the basins uh, for washing clothes, the plasters from two water reservoirs, the aqueduct, several joint mortars from the masonry, and roof plasters. The Akaki is a late Roman excavation site located near the village um, Pigadia that consists of a Roman villa now known as the Hippodromus House. It has several impressive mosaics and a main and secondary pool an aqueduct system for the circulation of water, reception rooms, and a workshop or storage area. The material that was sampled were plasters from the main and secondary pool, the aqueduct, the water cistern, uh, substrate layers of mosaics, wall plasters, and joint mortars from uh, the masons. Already from the macroscopic results, the macroscopic observation, we can differentiate three types of plasters at Kitty and Pangula, uh, with the two first types being possibly hydraulic. The first type is used as a first layer to uh, the washing basins and the water reservoirs. It has a pinkish brown color and it's very friable. There are uh, ceramic fragments also found within the major. The second type of hydraulic plaster, it, a hydraulic plaster is used in the aqueduct and it has very good cohesion. Within the matrix, we can also see small ceramic fragments. The third type is used in the rest of the uh, structure, so the second layer uh, of plaster in the washing basins, the joint motors, and the roof plasters. Uh, it is very white and it has very good cohesion. Also, it is quite lightweight, which indicates that it might be uh, gypsum plasters. At Akaki, we can differentiate four types uh, of plasters. The first one is used as the first, the first layer of plaster uh, in the water structure, so the pools and the aqueduct. It has a pink color due to the high percentage of ceramic fragments and powder, and it has a very good cohesion. Um, the second type is used as the second layer um, of plaster to the water structure and as a substrate to the mosaics and as a wall plaster. It has good cohesion and we can also detect ceramic fragments within the matrix. The third type, the third type is used as a joint mortar in the matrix. It has a grayish color and a medium cohesion. There are no ceramic fra uh, fragments found within the matrix, uh, but we can see a few line lamps uh, within, uh, within the matrix. Uh, also, it seems that uh, there are uh, smaller aggregates with, um, within the samples, uh, but of uh, higher quantity. Lastly, the fourth type is the plasters used in the water reservoir, uh, which seems to have a similar matrix to the rest of the types, but it has larger and more unified rounded aggregates. Uh, also, no ceramic fragments were uh, detected. With the portable uh, XRF analysis, we can detect whether lime or gypsum plasters uh, were present with the detection of calcium uh, or sulfur. At Kition, the third type has up to 13% of sulfur. So indeed, we do have uh, gypsum plasters, but it is very peculiar that we detect uh, sulfur in the hydraulic plasters. We also find a large, uh, large quantities of chlorine, which can be explained by the proximity to the seawater uh, or the use of seawater um, in the structure such as the washing basins. At Akaki, there is no presence of sulfur. We can only see um, calcium mainly, so only lime plasters were used. Also, we can produce a ternary diagram um, of the aluminum, silicon, calcium um, oxides to visually estimate the hydraulicity of plasters. It seems that the majority uh, of the samples from Akaiki are more hydraulic than the ones uh, of Kition Fabula, except of a couple um, uh, samples from Kition. Uh, 
Uh, but I must mention that this is a preliminary way uh, to uh, estimate the hydraulicity and can sometimes be faulty or are unreliable. Uh, with the XRD analysis, we can detect the major and minor mineralogical phases of the material, and at Kitium Pabula, we detect calcite and gypsum uh, due to the binder and quartz, uh, albite, clinochlor, actinolite, uh, diopsite, and alkyne, mainly due to the uh, aggregates. Uh, so we have uh, lime and gypsum clusters, and uh, we can also detect halite, which obviously derives from uh, the um, as a sea salt. Um, we still don't know if the gypsum in the hydraulic clusters <coughs> is in the binder uh, or the aggregates. Um, yes, the mineralogical profile of the aggregates tells us uh, that we have plagioclast and pyroxene minerals. So diabase aggregates were used for the production of uh, the lime plasters. Furthermore, the plasters used in the aqueduct have a larger quantity of calcite uh, to uh, quartz in comparison to the other side of hydraulic plasters. So they must have a higher binder to aggregate ratio. The gypsum plasters consist almost entirely uh, of uh, gypsum. Uh, which means that gypsum aggregates were used in these um, in this, uh, samples, in these plasters. The Akaki samples show a similar mineralogical profile, but without the presence of gypsum or, or halite. We have the use only of light plasters, and again, uh, we have the use of diabase aggregates uh, for the production of these uh, materials. Um, the plaster used as a first layer um, uh, meaning the uh, pools and the aqueducts and as wall plasters have larger quantity of calcite to the rest of the minerals. So they must have uh, a higher binder to aggregate ratio. The second layers, uh, meaning the substrate, the second layer to the uh, water structures, uh, the joint mortars and the water reservoirs uh, have a larger quantity of uh, quartz, albite, actinolite, and clinoprol. So it must mean that they have a lower binder to aggregate ratio. So in this presentation, um, we saw that at Kitium Pabula, uh, the lime plasters were used only on structures with immediate contact to water, like the cisterns, the basins, the aqueduct, and gypsum plasters were used for uh, the rest of the structures. Ceramic fragments must have been used as a pozzolanic material at the uh, Kitio Bambulam, uh, but further investigation needs to be done uh, to identify their, hydrolo uh, their hydraulic characteristics. Uh, a substantial quantity of gypsum was found in the lime mortars, um, which again could be either from the aggregates or the binders, so we need to further investigate uh, separately the binder and the aggregates. Um, halite and large quantities of chlorine uh, were detected in several samples, which uh, probably um, is due to the proximity uh, to the sea or the use of seawater. Uh, at Akaki, only lime plasters were found, and as a hydraulic plaster, uh, we, we see the use of hydraulic plaster as a first layer to the pools and the aqueducts, uh, with the use of ceramic fragments and powder as a pozzolanic material. So we have the use of opus sinium in this um, excavation site. The plasters uh, used as a substrate have a lower binder to aggregate ratio, but again, we need to um, uh, we need to do further analysis on that to be exactly sure about it. Uh, the aggregates used were mainly diabase for both excavation sites, at least for the lime plasters, and lastly, the um, late Roman plasters seem to be generally more hydraulic than the kitchen uh, plaster um, uh, samples, but further investigation with thermal analysis in the binder needs to be done. Thank you very much. Our last presentation for this session is from Matik Kiki from Kapolis University of Lebanon.
Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm Mathilde, I am from uh, the University of Leuven in Belgium, and uh, today I'm gonna give you some food for thoughts of the initial markers uh, that I analyzed macroscopically and microscopically uh, from the Roman baths uh, in Sagalassos. First of all, uh, where is the site? Um, Sagalassos is uh, located in modern day Turkey in the province of uh, Bordur. And since the 1980s, it has been excavated uh, by KU uh, Basically, the excavations, they showed us that the site was occupied uh, since prehistoric time, but during the Roman period, it saw like a great flourishment and urban expansion. During this urban expansion, of course, uh, mortars materials were used, which uh, the, it's this concoction of binder, aggregates, additives, and admixtures. And these mortars so far, they've been investigated through the conservation point of view. Why? Because the site is very high up in the mountains. Uh, so there are quite harsh uh, climatic conditions and the monuments are exposed, so they wanted to preserve this site, finding compatible recipes. However, I'm not a conservator, I'm an archeologist, so I'm trying to make sense of these materials from a technological uh, point of view. So from raw materials to the finished products. So as you can see, the site is quite vast. Uh, my materials come from uh, a wide um, range of areas, but today we're just gonna focus uh, on the Roman baths, as you can see right in the middle. So this was the Roman bath area in 2006. Why in 2006? Because my samples were extracted during that time. As you probably know, now it's very hard to export fresh samples from Turkey. Uh, and I have about uh, 20 samples from the Roman bath area. Now I'll tell you more where they come from. Uh, all of them are mainly masonry mortars, so they're used in walls or columns. So uh, the first areas, uh, as you can see, uh, I tried to cover most of the Roman bath area that was excavated back in the day. So Calidarium, Tifidarium, Frigidarium, and Hypocostum, more or less three samples for each room, two or three. And these rooms are dated, have been dated from the second to the fourth century AD. Then there are some more uh, samples coming from the Caldarium II and the Frigidarium and Apoditarium, and one area that is not pictured, the service room. And these are a slightly later phase, uh, fourth to fifth century AD. Um, so yeah, these can provide a short diachronic perspective on the Roman mortars. As you can see now, um, the Roman bath um, area has clearly changed. With the new excavations, they found new structures, um, but the previous dating is still standing and is still valid. So what I've done so far, um, I've analyzed um, 14 samples uh, with a macroscopic perspective um, and a microscopic perspective. Um, and um, four samples are still waiting for microscopic thin section analysis. And what I usually do is that I record as much as possible all the characteristics. Why? Because even if these materials are quite ugly, as you can see, they're still undergoing some destructive analysis that can be useful for future uh, work, but it also helps us make macroscopic group and have an idea of our material. However, um, the problem is that we see great variability in these samples, uh, despite their from similar areas or similar periods, as you can see macroscopically. Um, 
So yeah, we have more pinkish one, grayish one, um, but there are no clear groups already macroscopically. So this is a big problem. Um, so I tried to make sense of the macroscopic features, looking at the environments and else. So in terms of color, um, as you can see here, we have grayish mortars on the left side, um, which are more like correlated, of course, with uh, non-moisture structures, but not necessarily. And pinker mortars are more correlated to moisture structures, so moisture full structures, but again, not necessarily. We have some pinker ones that are correlated to non-moisture structures. What is clearer though, is that the grayer ones are definitely harder to scratch test than the pinker ones, which are softer and much more friable. Then we run some density and porosity tests uh, through water immersion. And as we can see, the density ranges from 1.1 to 1.6 and the porosity from 32 to 46%. And these are values that we would expect from uh, historic lime mortars. Um, however, they look quite porous. And I try to see this variable in the macroscopic perspective with colors, but also topography. So in terms of color, we can see that the whitish, uh, more whitish mortars, they do cluster on like the lower, like higher porosity, lower density. But of course the samples are only 20. So to make further statements, we need much more. Um, and in terms of topography, we wanted to analyze the compaction and we see the mortars with UF, so flat surfaces as well, uh, have like a restricted, more restricted range of density and topography um, of um, density and porosity. Further on, I uh, am keeping to analyze these mortars from the uh, thin section view, um, trying to figure out the pores and what like coarse fine fractions are present. And here I will present and show you some uh, results from the microscopic perspective. So here we see some photos in XPL and PPL, mainly showcasing the porosity. On the left, we have bugs uh, that are usually hundreds of microns to millimeters big. And this can show us that probably, yes, there was a very poor compaction of the materials. In the middle photo, we have uh, classic um, vesicles. And so here we, we can um, understand that maybe there was some entrapped air or entrapped water during the mixing. And on farther on the right, there are some channels or planes, and these can be due to a different number of reasons. For instance, the drying was too rapid or the mixture was too thick. Also, we had a fat mix, so more binder than aggregate, more than a third. Uh, so these claims will have to be further investigated. In terms of sorting, as you can clearly see, they're mainly poorly sorted um, on the left side. Um, and on the right side, it seems more moderately sorted, but it's not, cle it's not clearly not well sorted, uh, meaning that these additions and these components were probably not pre-treated with sieving or sifting in these materials. In terms of ground mass in the end, uh, we can see that we have on the left uh, heterogeneous um, critic binder, and this might be due to a poor mixing of the material. In the middle, it, it is very homogeneous, uh, so it's an homogeneous micritic binder, so it could be, you know, a better mix uh, than the other one. And the third one, which is one that we see quite common, not that common in the Roman bats, is like very low birefringence uh, binder. So we need to further confirm it with other techniques because it looks very faint. Uh, it's not a problem of the thin section, so we need further analysis to investigate it. In terms of the components, uh, we, we can see 
a lot of ceramics and some mortars, but only a couple have very frequent ceramic. Then we see in the middle picture, uh, pumice, and this uh, represents the largest group so far. Uh, and also a mix of the two like ceramic and pumice, but also other materials are much more present. Um, as you can see on further on the left, we can have pumice and lime lumps indicating the dry slaking and so just enough mixture to uh, produce these materials. Also ceramic and lime lumps again. And then we can see uh, volcanic materials uh, such as trachy basalts or trachytes uh, and also charcoal further on the right. So um, the future directions is to finish this microscopic analysis on the last four Roman bats and exa examine with the whole set of samples to have the bigger picture on what is going on in the other areas of the site. Um, but at the moment, what it looks like is that the high presence of bugs and heterogeneous micrites and poor sorting and a lot of variability in the Roman bats might mean um, that these mortars were made with a specific recipe. However, this picture might change greatly um, after including the other set of samples. Um, so further on, we uh, want to proceed by looking at uh, compressive strengths and binder aggregate ratios, and also by means of XRD and SEM. Thank you. This is the time for questions. Do you have any questions for our first speaker, Arfondula Baruda? I have a question for you. Uh, do you have any marks of crumbling on floors or other types of, of activities? Uh, yes, I found them. Okay. Uh, but not in the So yes, I have only found uh, have only found dunk, but in the informal floors, in the poorly made floors, not in the formal ones that I saw with the man cluster. So the type of activities on formal floors, do we do we have any idea no, on the type of activities? Uh, I mean, any remains on the surface? No, because it seems, as I said, that they um, kept them relatively clean. Okay. Uh, but for the informal floors, yeah, we find bad stuff, including that. Uh, any difference on the intensity of trampling, which can explain maybe any types of activities or the circulation? Um, yeah, I don't have any results for okay. that yet, but uh, we'll probably see. That. Okay. Thank you Thank very you. much. Our next, next speaker was Katerina. Any questions for Katerina? Can I ask you something? Uh, do you have any other analysis from other coffins from the same period just to compare your results? And do you see something which is similar or different to? So yeah, the idea of the PhD is to, is to compare different coffin sets. So for now, I just finish, almost finished the cap one and the comparative fragment, but they are from the same time and from the same period uh, and also from the same area. But we also have uh, another coffin with a very, very complicated name uh, that uh, is very difficult to remember. So <laughs> thank you for asking. And, 
uh, Nashpa something uh, that is from the third intermediate period. So we are starting by day in uh, January. Okay. And then we have uh, other like funerary masks uh, and cartonage from the same period that we are going to analyze. So there is a similarity of technology. So for now, what we can different. Yeah, no, for now, yeah, what we can see, for example, with fragments and with uh, uh, Pakepu is that we have uh, this, the same process, uh, as at least this is what appears with uh, the SEM, uh, the S, uh, and also with the FTIR. And uh, we also wanted to do some analysis with uh, the XRD, but all of this depends uh, on uh, the samples <laughs> and the size of the samples that are giving me. And so we will see. Okay, thank you. Uh, third speaker was Paula Pizzo. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I noticed that when you included the XR data, there was one specific example that you came to the so For the audience online, the question was um, on the content of the portable XR app results. There were some uh, containing a lot of uh, sulfur. And yes, it's actually the two for purely gypsum uh, plasters uh, that, um, of course, also contain the part of calcite because gypsum is made by the, both the elements. But yes, those were uh, the two pure gypsum samples that we have. Coincidentally, they were both meson, well, maybe not coincidentally, but <laughs> they were both masonry mortars. Um, and yeah, we, we do have this pure gypsum, almost pure. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for and this question can actually from Finder, it's a much more mm -hmm. So as you can imagine, I'm going to ask you about the sample of NPT12, mm -hmm. the sample. And you said something about that it was used to cover the seeking of the theater or something like that? No, this one, um, so NPT12 was actually the waterproof oh, water. Water. It yes. was used to, uh, but you said something about um, boxes and oil? Yes, basically it was used in a structure that has been identified as a water-related structure. Ah, so so okay. we were expecting it to be a waterproof mortar. And it also had like the typical pinkish color that you see in the other presentation, a lot of like ceramic aggregates. So we were expecting it to be waterproof. But the porosity is very high and the water absorption is also very high. So the two hypotheses were that either they were enhancing the waterproofing by adding boxes and oil because they um, closed the pores. Okay, so this was my question. Mm -hmm. Do you have any evidence of that practice in Cyprus? We don't have the evidence for Cyprus. We do have the evidence from other area. I think the Levant for sure. Um, we didn't have any evidence for Cyprus, and that's why we are analyzing that sample with Malditov to extract possibly lipids, but that's like a, an ongoing examination still. But it's it would be a, a very interesting thing because I don't think there is any other uh, similar instance, but Mirto probably knows more <laughs> about this process. In, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any questions for me for me to So the question was uh, if the uh, samples found uh, at Akaki were uh, 
typically uh, found material uh, in similar periods? And the answer is yes. Uh, it is a very Roman thing, especially to have uh, the the cocciopesto used, um, especially in uh, water structures dealing with uh, fresh water as well. And of course, here in Cyprus, we don't have a lot of resources, at, at least in antiquity, of uh, natural puzzlelands. So yes, and also the, um, especially the sec, the first and the relationship between the first and second layer in the water structures. I have seen a few. Um, uh, some other publication that mentioned it uh, in the same way that they have this first and second layer. So yes, it's a very typical Roman thing uh, to do in like villas and stuff like that. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I have a question. It's not specific for the show, but for pretty much everyone who was presented uh, about cluster uh, in general. Uh, I am uh, completely, you know, uh, illiterate in this field, uh, but I realized that there are two main components, the aggregates and the binding material. That binding material, does it in include uh, organic stuff and what kind of stuff, mm -hmm. uh, like the animal uh, parts, mm -hmm. collagens, uh, gel gelatin, essentially? Mm -hmm. And if there are recipes, say, uh, Written sources from. Uh, okay. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to answer for the, uh, of course, the rest of the presenters are welcome to answer this. Yeah, but the, um, the raw materials uh, to start are basically, uh, firstly, inorganic, but organic materials, we see them as additives. For example, uh, uh, even uh, straw or hay or uh, even sometimes like goat hair, we can see they are added for uh, more uh, a structural um, in a structural way. So we have like a better Fibers. yes, exactly Fibers. yes, or even uh, for moisture control as well. Uh, also, sometimes we have a lot of uh, additives like uh, egg whites and even blood, sometimes like ox blood and several juices. But then again, they were playing with uh, uh, these materials. Uh, for now, I don't think any, any one of us except Paola uh, has um, an idea or at least the presented material um, that they might have used that. Uh, what else? Yes. I mean, we just have is a sample which we are trying to explain in this way, but we still don't have an input. It's undergoing yeah. the market of examination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all the things you listed have been actually identified or they are mentioned? Sources have they, uh, they have a, they have been publicated. Yes, they have been publications that have identified this uh, sort of materials. And also for um, the question that you uh, about recipes, yes. uh, isn't uh, what's his name? Uh, um, uh, there is uh, only in Roman time we have actual recipes on what to use and uh, ratios and uh, for different type of structures. Uh, but that comes up on, uh, from the Roman times and it's more um, controlled, let's say. It's Vitruvius. It's Vitruvius, yes, thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 It's always yeah. Vitruvius. Thank you. And the uh, access uh, is like Vitruvius. <laughs> <laughs> and any questions for our last speaker? I have a question for you. Uh, I was wondering if uh, frost and thaw activity can affect or can be seen in materials because it's also like a source, it's an attitude. So I was wondering if frost or thaw activity can affect the quality of material. Of the ancient seen. material that I'm looking yes. at, yes. like secondary process. Secondary or, or even during the use of baths. Okay, uh, during the use, I, I don't really know, but what I, what I can see now uh, from like my material is that um, like the, the mortars that don't have ceramics at all, uh, they, they look like more degraded. We see more secondary processes and it, it might be, you know, uh, because of like freeze and thawing or something else, maybe they weren't as protected, but yeah. Okay. This is all I can. Thank you.
It's not specifically for you, Patty. Okay. It's my one of my questions about glasses in general uh, from a ceramic point of view. We saw at your sample with some drinking waters, we saw large fragments of ceramics that are easily easily recognizable by them. But I'm always wondering about the ceramic powder used as a possible answer. And my main question is addressed to everyone who is here for this. Uh, this is like, were they really making ceramics in the powder to use it? And because the main thing powder, especially fire ceramics, should be like really big difficult. So my main question is like, were they using fire ceramics or they were using something different like red clay, let's say something like that, in order to use the same properties but not deal with crushing in the powder, a very hard material. So that's my question. For the analysis that I have for now, I cannot say because they do see clays, but mm. since they're powdered, I have no way to know if they're burnt or not. I can only say it for the larger aggregates, which I do have, and I can see that they're fired. But for the rest, you only see it mineralogically clay, and it's hard to say if it was like just the powder, the fire, the clay. Or the Basically, my question is about right now. Whether you, you call something ceramic or not, especially when it comes in this form, like about them. It's, it's interesting because with plasters, there's problems of terminology also in architectural form, <laughs> and then there is problems with geologists. And then, for instance, they don't really like calling something hydraulic because there is a different definition of natural hydraulic, oxalum, and water curve. Especially with what, what you're saying, like now, powder means something like grain size, really, really small, really, really small. Yeah. Which means that how can you be sure that they come from ceramic? You can't, which is why normally you say just clay. Thank you. You <laughs> 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 try the trick is to try to be as general as you can. <laughs> Any other questions for our speakers? Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. And thank you also for respecting the time. Uh, see you all then at half past four after our coffee break. Thank you. I'd like to inform everyone again that on the first floor, we have our posters. Feel free to wander around. The poster session, yes. And for our online friends, I'm gonna share a slideshow with all the posters. You can directly send a message to the presenters of the posters. And 10 minutes before the start of our next session, we wait for you to have any questions for the online presenters of the posters. Thank you.